Today's conversation, the voices of the global South, islands keeping 1.5 alive, touches close to home for me. So I'm really excited to moderate today's conversation around this crucial question. What can we do in the lead up to COP26 to advocate for climate resilience in island nations? The key findings from the recent IPCC report reveal that we are not on track to meet our targets of 1.5 degrees Celsius and the increasing extreme climate impacts around the world accelerate the urgency of answering this question. In today's session, we'll discuss how the subject matters to everyone. Building resilience in island nations offers the framework for ensuring resilience and equity in global communities. This can pave the way or the pathway for achieving 1.5 degrees Celsius in the decisive decade. I'd like to kickstart things by introducing our panel of speakers and providing an overview of what the next 90 minutes will entail. First, you will hear from Dr. Fletcher, founder and managing director of Soloricon, working in St. Lucia. Next, we'll have Hiram Williams, Renewable Energy Manager at Fondacion Comunitaria de Puerto Rico. We also have RMIs, Leticia Demerez, Director of Climate Finance Access Network, CFAN. And to close, close us out, we'll hear from Leah Nicholson, Climate Advisor with Alliance of Small Nations, EOSIS, Small Island States, EOSIS, permanent mission of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations. After listening to, the insightful of, to their insights, we will reserve 20 minutes for us to all participate and reflect with a Q&A session. Do keep yourselves on mute for the duration of the webinar and go ahead and drop your questions into the Zoom chat function. With that said, I'm excited to hand it over to my dear friend, Dr. Fletcher. I've had the privilege to work with Dr. F closely with Dr. Fletcher over the past several years. Dr. Fletcher was a key player in amplifying and uniting the voices of the Caribbean to negotiate 1.5 degrees Celsius as a global climate target in the Paris Agreement. I am pleased to have him start us off today. Dr. Fletcher. Thank you very much, David, and good day to everyone. And thank you for this opportunity to speak on a subject that is very dear to my heart, and I'm certain very dear to the hearts of everyone who is tuned in to this webinar. And that's 1.5 degrees Celsius, how we got there, what it means, and where we're going. If you will permit me to just say a little bit about about the 1.5 degrees and, and what it means to us. Okay, I apologize. Looks like uh, Dr. Fletcher's screen may have frozen there a bit. Give us a few seconds. Let's see if it comes back shortly. Okay, we'll give them a few more seconds uh, if we are unable to iron out the communication challenge. 
we will roll forward to our next presenter and then come back to Dr. Fletcher. Be able to for a minute. Okay, Dr. Fletcher is having some uh, communication challenges. We're going to move forward with uh, the introduction of our next speaker and then come back to Dr. Fletcher thereafter. Um, <clears throat> okay, in, next in our program, uh, we have our, our next speaker that's gonna talk a little bit about energy equity and how it can be achieved because energy equity is a big part of building resilience in the, Caribbean, in the Caribbean and for small island states. And this is something that um, Hiram Williams, our next guest, can, can speak to closely with the work that he's done in Puerto Rico uh, to initiate and advocate uh, for positions around equity at the Center for Clean Energy Transition in Puerto Rico. Hiram, take it away. Thank you, David. Um, greetings to all from the staff of Puerto Rico Community Foundation. To those who may not know me, I am Iran Williams Figueroa, Renewable Energy Manager at the Puerto Rico Community Foundation. FCPR, by its Spanish acronym, is a philanthropic institution with 35 years of service committed to developing the capacities of communities. FCPR's community knowledge has enabled us to design programs that respond to community needs and opportunities with grants, technical assistance, and capacity building. Since Hurricane Maria, we have developed a strategic plan to promote strengthen equitable access to clean water, renewable energy, social housing, community, economic development, and education, among other things. Next slide, please. Our objective is to reduce the inequity gap in the communities of Puerto Rico by building community capitals, physical, human, financial, social, ecological, and cultural. This objective stimulates the growth of community assets, such as water, energy, and food security, strengthening self-reliance, economic development, home security, and education. Next slide, please. As we all know, we are at the doorstep of the most discussed 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold, which is more likely to be reached Hi, it appears uh, Hiram is also frozen. It appears we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty uh, the day of Zoom and communications and coming in from all parts of the world uh, sometimes present a challenge here. We uh, would like to give him a few seconds to see if we can get uh, Hiram back up. Bear with us, please. We apologize for the slight delays and technical challenges we're facing.
we do know that we have Dr. Fletcher who's rejoined us, but um, we'd like to give Aram an opportunity to continue with the flow of his presentation. So one minute, please, and we'll be right with you. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, we'll see if we can have them, uh, hear him in particular, call in via telephone. All right, well, we'd like to take a, a, a moment to, while we wait for the return of Hiram, if we can ask you to type in the chat uh, where you are joining us from. It's always interesting to see where persons are joining our sessions from across the world, sometimes in some very unique and interesting places. Let's see Puerto Rico, New York City, Illinois, London, Philadelphia, UK, St. Lucia. Yeah, so we have a wide representation of countries and regions on the session today. We thank you for your patience, and I think we will, we certainly appreciate you being here and participate in this session. Buffalo, New York, Colorado, California, Puerto Rico again, and Trinidad and Tobago. Um, thank you all for being here today. All right, so we have um, Ram is back with us. And we'd like Ram, if you don't mind picking up where you started, Thank you so much for jumping back and join, rejoining the conference. Thank you, thank you, David. I apologize for the inconvenience and the internet. Going back to the slide, because of geographical limitations, response and recovery can become very challenging in contrast with the mainland logistics. An obsolete and fragile energy grid can hinder recovery and adaptation to climate change. And most of those who will bear the brunt outcomes and will be disproportionately affected will be underserved and hard to reach rural island communities. Episodes of extreme heat and urban heat are powerful environment stress factors that re represent a threat to human health and well being. Physical health, mental health, human well being seem to be specifically interconnected with heat waves. LMI disadvantaged communities are more likely to be disproportionately affected by elevated temperatures. Next slide, please. 
While some heat and humidity impacts can be avoided by acclimatization and behavioral adaptation, there is a limit to survival under sustained exposure. Even with idealized conditions of perfect health, total inactivity, total shed, shade, absence of clothes, and unlimited drinking water, increased energy consumption can strain energy infrastructure, especially during periods of maximum energy demand. For example, on days when temperature exceeds 90 degrees, the demand for electricity can exceed the capacity of power generating facilities and the electrical grid. Service interruptions may occur, including the possibility of widespread power outages. Increasing cases of peak electricity demand could also affect production and transmission costs, ultimately increasing service costs to, cons to consumers. Mid and low income communities may not be able to evade the heat with air conditioning where its use could increase energy consumption that they may not be able to afford. Next slide, please. The complexity of this subject denotes a great level of urgency that requires the most comprehensive and inclusive mitigation efforts in order to draw down emissions and optimize our adaptation efforts. Fortunately, local energy resilience is happening today in Puerto Rico, but funding is still often a key barrier to an equitable distribution of systems. Next slide, please. For this reason, the Rockefeller Foundation, Rocky Mountain Institute, and Puerto Rico Community Foundation are jointly working on the Puerto Rico Community Energy Resilience Initiative, CIRI, to promote energy security in communities vulnerable to climate change. This will diminish financing barriers and increase local capacities to improve access to renewable energy. Next slide, please. Our long-term term goal is to increase the availability of clean and resilient and renewable sources for sustainable community development and to ensure the continuity of essential services and products during emergencies and power outages. Next slide. Our main objectives are to encourage coordination between nonprofit organizations and the private sector to strengthen the energy resilience of vulnerable communities in Puerto Rico, to enhance philanthropic capital and to facilitate access to affordable financing for critical facilities, to promote equitable distribution of philanthropic support for energy resilience in Puerto Rico, to support capacity building in the management of renewable energy resources and to share lessons learned for sustainable community development and to promote the development of a decentralized energy systems to strengthen and provide redundancy to the current electric service. Next slide, please. The critical facilities we aim to support are community organizations or businesses that provide and have provided essential services for life and therefore require continuity of operation, especially during and after natural disasters or emergencies as what happened with Maria. Next slide, please. At SETI, we seek the creation of resilient energy systems that empower communities by means of ensuring the continuity of basic services and economic activity, while producing new sources of employment and workforce development. At the same time, we confront some challenges for making the transition to a modern, clean, cost-effective and resilient system. A weak and vulnerable electric grid endangers the, the community resilience and recovery capacity of Puerto Rico. Electricity rates may increase depending in part of the outcome of the Puerto Rico Power Authority's restructuring agreement of debt, privatization and privatization process. At the same time, there are significant barriers to the implementation of microgrids that include access and cost of capital, lack of knowledge and experience in renewable energy projects. The fossil fuel generation proposal may not improve community resilience as it continues to depend on vulnerable infrastructure. Next slide, please. 
Nonetheless, our coalition has already developed more than 90 microgrids across Puerto Rico in mid and low income housing, schools, community centers, primary care centers, and community aqueducts. Next slide, please. Some of the benefits of the series will bring to communities will help decrease GHG emissions and lessen the impacts of climate change by shifting dependency on fossil fuels. It will strengthen resilience and energy capacity within the energy system in Puerto Rico by facilitating the transition to renewable energy. It will also promote the development of, of facilities that provide essential services to communities in hard to reach areas in the island. Next slide, please. While carrying out our mitigation efforts, we must ask ourselves, how do we navigate climate dynamism? Our communities hold the key to resilience and energy equity and can be a pathway through which we further empower their efforts. Reducing island communities' vulnerability is in a benevolent society to present to, pres to present and future climate hazards is most, li most likely dependent on their adaptational capacity to manage risk. And this capacity in turn requires equitable access to rights, resources, and renewable energy power for all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Haram. It's, uh... It was a pleasure to hear more about uh, your work with Siri and all the great things you're doing there. It is important to note that Puerto Rico is a United States territory and therefore cannot access international financial resources. However, Siri's work can function as a scalable model of, of how to unlock access to financial resources and pave the way to an equitable global energy transition. I think at this time, it is very important for us to hear a little about some of the work, again, that islands have been doing to lead up to COP26 and some of the great work that Dr. Fletcher and other representatives of his program have been doing within the islands. Um, so I won't do the full introduction again of Dr. Fletcher, but I'm happy that he's back with us again to restart his presentation. Thank you for, for being here with us today, Dr. Fletcher. Please go right ahead. Thank you, David, and thank you for your patience. Um, Mulfi has been very hard at work today, so hopefully we can get past him. Please tell me that you are seeing my slides. Yes, we are. Okay, great. Okay, so um, again, I want to thank you for putting on this, this, this webinar. I think it's extremely important and very timely. Maybe we should just take a little bit of a, of a memory stroll to remember how we got here with 1.5. And really this, this was the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement was, was a monumental agreement. It, it gave us a global legal platform to tackle the myriad problems of climate change. Um, and one of the things that, that we found, anybody who, who was part of the SIDS delegation would know that during the talks, during the negotiations, leading up to Paris, but also in Paris, SIDS were very focused, very engaged, and, and knew what they wanted to get out of these negotiations. We went in there with a clear list of what were our red line issues, what were the things that we, we needed a Paris agreement to speak to, and we will focus on, in ensuring that we would get those things. There was very strong leadership from the French, and I think the French have to be um, commended for the, for the way in which they manage the, the negotiations. President Obama and the, and the USA were constructively engaged. Um, that was a feature. President Obama had engaged in a, in a round of um, climate diplomacy prior to the COP21, where he had gone and, and met with Xi Jinping of China and Modi of, of India to really set the stage and try to develop the momentum that was needed for an ambitious Paris Agreement. And the UN Secretary General, who at the time was Ban Ki-moon, was very sympathetic to the concerns of small island developing states. One of the things that we did as small island developing states was we cultivated allies, strategic alliances, 
on the High Ambition Coalition, which really was a, a, the brainchild of my the now deceased colleague from the Marshall Islands, Tony DeBrun, um, that High Ambition Coalition grew with every meeting and it was able to bring in people, bring in countries that were all committed to a very ambitious um, Paris Agreement. And as usual, our negotiators, we really can't see enough about them. Our negotiators always punch above their weight. They're always outnumbered in the negotiations, but they always do a yeoman's job of bringing home the best texts, the best agreements for us. And once again, in Paris, we saw our, our negotiators at their very best. Um, our artists supported our work. We were able to get a civil society coalition going, and we had artists from around the Caribbean very invested in what was going on. Um, this is Kendall Hippolyte from St. Lucia, one of our foremost sports. But our young people, the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, were also very engaged. And some of them came to Paris with us and were part of the negotiations, were part of the delegations, and, and, and gave us the strength that, that helped us to know that we were not just negotiating as technical negotiators, but really for the first time, we had the civil society of the Caribbean behind us. And one of the things that we, we did in Paris was we used the international media to tell our story to the world. Anyone who wanted to listen to us, um, Associated Press, BBC, Carbon Brief. I probably spent as much time negotiating the media and ensuring that we got our message out as I did in the negotiating theaters. And really what we achieved in Paris was historic, but it didn't really, it didn't always appear that we would have, we would have gotten there because this is, a, this is a, an article from the Washington Post by Chris Mooney at the beginning of the talks. And he basically was speaking about small island developing states and, and making the point that small island developing states are really at the moral center of the climate debate. And will they be left behind once again? Will we have a Paris Agreement that will not speak to the needs of small island developing states? Halfway through the negotiations after the first week, um, Chris wrote another article that, that, that spoke to the fact that 1.5 was starting to be, people were starting to talk about 1.5. Prior to that, two degrees Celsius was recognized as the long-term temperature goal. It was only small island developing states and small, climate vulnerable countries who were speaking 1.5. We were getting pushed back that there was no science to support 1.5, that 1.5 was too ambitious. But towards the middle of the negotiations, it appeared that 1.5 was actually starting to gain momentum. And that's as a result of the excellent work done by SIDS. And at the end of the, the negotiations on the 13th of December, the day after the Paris Agreement was adopted, um, we really saw that we overcame all the odds and got 1.5 degrees Celsius as the long-term temperature goal in the text of the Paris Agreement, which if anyone who was involved in negotiations will tell you, that was a very long reach um, when these negotiations started. And it's very heartening to see now that the conversation, the global conversation on climate change has moved away from two degrees Celsius and has recognized that 1.5 degrees Celsius is where we should be. Caribbean and other small island developing states were among the first to both sign and ratify the Paris Agreement when it was open for signature at the UN on Earth Day in 2016. And since then, however, we have not had the sort of momentum, the sort of achievements that we would have liked. And unfortunately, I have to say that time is running out. If we look at what has happened since 2015, the last six years have been the hottest years since 1850, the hottest years in the recent history of our planet. So 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020 have all set records for global surface temperature. And that's scary. 2020 last year was actually tied with 2016 as the hottest year ever. Um, the World Meteorological Organization put out a report not too long, a few, a few um, weeks ago, sometime in May, saying that the world will hit or may hit the 1.5 degree temperature threshold in the next five years. Arctic temperatures are rising and rising even faster than the average temperatures. And that has very serious implications because it means our polar ice caps are melting and are melting at a very scary rate. Last year, um, a town in Siberia, which Siberia is a place that's synonymous with, with desolation, cold temperatures, frigid temperatures. A town in Siberia reached 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. We haven't seen 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit in St. Lucia or in many of our other Caribbean countries. So that is quite scary. Um, Greenland's ice is melting at the rate scientists thought was the worst case scenario for 2070. So the ice melt in Greenland is 50 years ahead of schedule. Antarctica last year recorded its hottest temperature ever. And these are the things that we're seeing in this year, 11th of August, a few weeks ago, 
we had a recorded temperature of 48.8 degrees Celsius, 119, almost 120 degrees Fahrenheit in Italy. Our oceans are warming at a, an, at a speed that has devastating consequences for marine life and our marine ecosystems. Um, sea levels are rising faster than expected. Again, because we're dealing with biological systems and you can't always predict what will happen with biological systems at a desktop, you know, there are a lot of feedback mechanisms. When one thing happens, it has implications for other things. And unfortunately, we're starting to see that with our biological systems on this planet. The ocean is getting more acidic. And what that means is that it is imperiling marine life. And we're already seeing in the Pacific, certain parts of the Pacific Ocean are getting so acidic that it's dissolving crab shells. Um, many of our, many of our um, creatures, underwater creatures need a particular pH, a particular acidity or lack of acidity really for them to create their shells. And when the oceans get too acidic, they're not able to, to form shells. And we're already seeing that. Um, and just two days ago, an editorial by 220 journals, including the Lancet and the British Medical Journal and the New England um, Journal of Medicine called on the global community to take emergency action on climate change. And when we look at what, where we're heading, we're seeing that with the current policies on the table from the various countries and the pledges and targets, we are overshooting 1.5 degrees Celsius by a wide margin. With the current policies, we probably will get to 2.9 degrees Celsius. With the current pledges and targets on the table, it'll be a little better, 2.6 degrees Celsius, but certainly nothing to, to be happy about. The recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change confirmed everything that we've been seeing, but gave us a scientific and empirical data that, that, that stated that human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in the last 2000 years, that each of the last four decades has been successively warmer than any decade that preceded it since 1850. So this is not um, you know, a, a, an anomaly, an artifact. This is not something that, okay, it's gonna come back to normal. This is a definite warming trend that we're seeing and the science is confirming that. In 2019, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations were higher than at any time on our planet in the last 2 million years. And the only reason 2020 did not break that record was because of the pandemic, the, the shutdown because of COVID-19, where we had a 7% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions because factories were shut down. There was very little air traffic taking place, but we are seeing a relentless increase in carbon dioxide. And then also in, in the other greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide. Um, and it, it's clear that human influence is very likely the, the main driver of global retreat of glaciers. Global mean sea level rise increased by only 1.3 millimeters per year between 1901 and 1971. Between 1971 and 2006, that increased to 1.9 millimeters per year. And in the last decade, between 2006 and 2018, it's gone up to 3.7 millimeters per year. And again, those are all these, that data was taken from the IPCC report. And the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events have increased since the 1950s over most land areas. So we're seeing a pattern, warmer temperatures, warmer oceans, greater sea level rise, more intense precipitation, um, global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to 1850 to 1900 would be exceeded during the 21st century on the all but one of the scenarios that has been looked at. And I presented this table, not so much that you could look at it to, to, to study it, but really to show you that on the all but one of the scenarios, the best estimate for global warming by the end of this century is 1.8 degrees, 2.7 degrees, or 3.6 degrees, or 4.4 degrees. So we're in very ominous territory. And with every additional increment of global warming, there'll be changes in, the changes in the extremes continue to become larger. For all small island developing states that their juggler, their economic and social juggler is right near the ocean, this will have devastating consequences. And Professor Michael Taylor at the University of the West Indies has done some of the work that models what a 2.5 degree Celsius warming would mean for the Caribbean. And again, the, the, the data there are quite startling. Moderate to severe drought approximately 34% of the time, over 200 days excessively warm, a reduction of between 15% to 25% in precipitation. All of these things do not bode well for us. More intense hurricanes, we have to dread. I can't say look forward to, we have to dread. Longer droughts, greater water insecurity, more heat waves, greater food insecurity, inundation of coastal communities. And I like to say that climate change is, uh, it, it doesn't respect anything. If like many of your other islands, St. Lucia, we bury our dead 
near the ocean because the, the soil is easier to work. It's a sandy soil. So if you think that by the year 2100, you'll be long gone, there's a very real possibility that your, your bones, instead of resting in peace, will probably be swimming in peace or sinking in peace because sea level rise will have taken over many of our cemeteries, at least in St. Lucia. I'm sure it's the same for many of the other islands. More forests and bushfires, increase in water and sanitation and hygiene related diseases, more loss and damage. Um, and again, these, these scenes, are, are all, we know them only too well. Dominica, um, the British Virgin Islands, Antigua and Barbuda, we all witness them. So the threat to small island developing states is existential. However, tackling climate change represents an excellent opportunity for SIDS to develop lasting resilience and pursue a sustainable development pathway. If we, if we marshal our resources, if we do what we need to do, we can put all of our countries on a path to sustainable development by making the investments in our infrastructure, in our social services, um, our environment. But again, it will require resolute and urgent action by the international community and also a significant mobilization of finance because the global adaptation gap is somewhere in the vicinity of 140 to 300 billion dollars currently. Um, and we are minuscule contributors to greenhouse gases, to the greenhouse gas emissions. You'll see that um, as a region, we probably contribute less than 0.2% to global greenhouse gases. Most of our countries contribute less than 0.001% of global greenhouse gases, yet we are the ones at the forefront of this fight. One of the things, and I, and I think that's where RMI comes in, RMI is very focused on renewable energy and how we can put ourselves on a pathway to a sustainable energy development model. And I think that's important because every single one of our countries has tremendous renewable energy potential, um, some more than others. Most of our countries, well, all of our countries have renewable energy potential for geothermal, well, for, sorry, for wind and for solar. Some have for geothermal, some have for water. If you look at the ARI potential of all of our Caribbean SIDS, it is quite significant. So we can transition our economies away from fossil fuels to renewable energy if we can get access to the funding and the technology. And that's important because in every single one of our countries, electricity tariffs, with the exception of course of Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname, electricity tariffs are quite high. So that is a damper on the competitiveness of every single economic sector. So moving away from fossil fuels does not only allow us to, to take that moral high ground and say to the rest of the developed world that look, we are minuscule contributors to global greenhouse gases, but yet we are playing our part in reducing our carbon footprint, but it also makes economic sense for us because it means that we will be making all of our economic sectors more competitive. We'll be allowing the, 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 the citizens of our countries to keep more money in their pockets because they're paying too much for electricity right now. So that really is one of the areas that I'm hoping that RMI will continue to assist us. Um, these are paintings by Jonathan Gladding, a St. Lucian painter who, um, the painting on the right, the one on the left, sorry, was the one that was our poster for, for COP21. And it really encapsulates where we are right now. We up to our necks in water, figuratively. Very soon we may up, be up to our necks in water, literally. So there's a very small window of opportunity for us to act, but it needs, as I said, urgent and resolute action by the international community. I've started a, 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 a project called the Caribbean Climate Justice um, Project. And if you want, you could get more information on it at caribbeanclimatejustice.org. And it really is looking to mobilize civil society and empower civil society so that we don't just depend on government, that we can do some of the things ourselves, but we can advocate for greater action on climate change. So that is my presentation. Sorry that it took so long to deliver it, but as I said, Murphy tried his best to, um, to derail things. But thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. And, and, and we know we always uh, face critical challenges and challenges of resiliency and communications and uh, storms and hurricanes and all types of things that try to distract us. So we thank you for staying strong and coming back in and giving us that excellent presentation. The, Dr. Fletcher, it's always engaging to hear you present about your experience leading up to the Paris Agreement and advocating for 1.5 uh, to stay alive. Your ability to make it real and demonstrate the level of urgency means so much. Thank you again for outlining how renewable energy is critical to building a resilient future. We, heard, we also heard from Hiram who spoke about the inequality gap in the vulnerable Puerto Rico, in vulnerable Puerto Rico communities 
and how they're building community capital to fight the impact of climate change in, in those communities. Uh, building a more equitable energy transition is very critical um, to small island states, and this is definitely something that um, our mind knows a little bit about. It is clear that on, on, unlocking access to financial resources can pave the way to a more equitable and global, uh, equitable global energy transition. We've heard from our island partners at RMI, and we understand that their um, access to finance is a common challenge in scaling resiliency, resilient equitable energy systems. In order to address this prevalent issue, RMI launched the Climate Finance Action Network, a program dedicated to unlocking climate finance for those in, in, um, in, 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 in need. And I'd like to invite my colleague and director of CFAN to share her insights and the story um, behind the CFAN program. Letitia? Thank you. Thank you, David, uh, for, for the introduction. Thank you very much to the previous presenters. Um, thank you, Dr. Fletcher, for T telling us about your, your experience uh, in the negotiation, but also as, as um, former minister of St. Lucia with as also on the ground, um, try to make the, the changes needed. Um, I think what the, those two first presentations are showing us is that not only small island developing states and island nations in general um, have demonstrated over the years, it's not only um, that they are vocal in the negotiation to make the moral, the moral argument for climate change and climate justice, but also their really strong willingness to lead by example. And as Dr. Fletcher was mentioning, the big if to go from what is possible to realizing uh, the transformation, realizing uh, sustainable development, the big if is if we can access to the resources, uh, the international resources, mobilize and leverage um, also national resources. Um, next. Um, and that's what the Climate Finance Access Network uh, is about, not only to um, assess the, the challenges that seeds um, are facing in accessing climate finance, both internationally and, and nationally, but also to size the opportunities. Um, you've heard from uh, the previous presentation, small island states are of not contributing significantly to cause the problem of climate change, however, they are disproportionately affected by its impacts. So vulnerabilities, um, reduction of vulnerability is top of priority of, uh, of small island developing states. However, um, it has proven extremely difficult to access uh, climate finance and in particular adaptation finance. And it's not because there's no financing available. We might not have reached the 100 billion, and you, you have heard about the 100 billion many times. Um, there are a lot of controversy around uh, how much have been delivered, um, how much has been mobilized from which resources, what counts, what doesn't count. But if we look beyond those methodological and defini definitional debates, uh, what really matters is how much has been accessed, um, as, how much has reached the ground and as supported making the changes that are needed to protect the vulnerable populations and to, um, to start the transition towards sustainable development um, in a holistic manner. What is the message that we get from colleagues and, and friends in small island developing states, but also in least developed countries, countries that are vulnerable and capacity constrained, is that the system for accessing climate finance has become highly complex, onerous, and extremely slow. Onerous in the sense that it takes a lot of a lot of resources from countries to just access funding that are supposed to be available to them and are supposed to be earmarked or prioritized to them. Um, seeds are facing those those systemic challenges, um, especially from multilateral sources. You may have heard the difficulties of accessing um, the international funds such as the Green Climate Fund with sometimes a uh, timeline up to two years to develop a project that then is going to be implemented over a certain period of time. Um, when you hear from, from Dr. Fletcher on, on these impacts of climate change that are accelerating, uh, that scientists themselves are surprised how fast um, they, are, uh, they are 
happening, uh, clearly the system internationally for accessing climate finance doesn't mirror the urgency that uh, vulnerable nations are facing. And the financing needs are, of, of seeds are unique. Uh, unique by because of their circumstances. Projects are, are sometimes uh, small and, and fall through the cracks of big international um, big international financiers. Uh, they are also cross-cutting because for a small island developing state, mitigation and adaptations are intrinsically linked. Cross-sectoral um, issues have to be addressed in, in um, a holistic way. As Dr. Fletcher was mentioning, it's not just about in mitigating climate change and mitigating its impact. It's about starting uh, to put economies of seeds towards the path of sustainable development and, and diversify the economy so they are less vulnerable to external shock. And there's simply no financial mechanism at the moment that is tailored for uh, seeds needs. So these challenges and, and the urgency of seed circumstances are which are supposed to be addressed through the convention, through the Paris Agreement that's, that mentions, stipulates that seeds, NLDCs and African countries are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change and therefore uh, should have ac priority access to the funding or at the funds level, all of these policies and, and modalities that are supposed to make it easier for seeds to access funding are simply not working. Um, and you can see this, this quote here from uh, managing Director of Climate Change and Development Authority in Papua New Guinea, uh, Mr. Ruel Yamuna, that says the problem um, is, is that access is obstructively complex. So hearing from uh, colleagues and friends in, in SEEDS, RMI decided, next slide please, um, to investigate, to understand, to dig deeper. Where is, um, where is the need how can we plug this gap? How can we unlock climate finance? And the response that we got from over 300 stakeholders that were consulted over a period of two years, um, the response was overwhelmingly um, that the, the need is at the project level. Um, there, is a, there is a gap in expertise, in know-how, um, how to develop projects, how to structure financially projects that will be bankable, that will be attractive, not only for international funds, but also for the private sector and over different um, funders, the multilateral, bilateral. Um, so as you can see, 72% um, of, the, of the participants of the survey um, stated that um, project and program design is a big need uh, for just immediately followed by uh, securing finance for projects. So it's clearly the downstream part of the project cycle in countries that is that requires at the moment additional capacity and expertise to ensure that those projects that have been identified as priorities can uh, reach the board of uh, directors of banks, multi, multi lateral development banks or green climate fund or other funds to be approved and, uh, and financed. Um, also, um, what was very uh, highlighting in the discussion with countries is that 96% of uh, Cs and, and LDCs country representatives told us, we know which project we need to develop. We have done our homework. We have developed our climate targets. We have sectoral plans. We have NAPs and NDCs and all those documents that have been required from us by the international community. And we have a vision. Um, what is the, the bottleneck is really at the development of um, a project stage. So from those discussions, CIFAN derived its key principles. First of all, um, the CIFAN initiative is demand driven. Um, it's really responding to needs of countries as a very uh, adaptive and agile approach uh, to answer to those needs. Um, CIFAN also strive to enhance country ownership uh, build local capacity and expertise, um, support not only uh, governments through um, their ministries or agencies, but also uh, support direct access entities. And finally, um, CFAN is going to focus, at least in this first stage, uh, on seeds and NDCs, since those, uh, those countries are not only, um, not only the most vulnerable, but also the most capacity constraints. Next slide, please. So focusing on the solution, um, the idea of, of CFAN um, was structured around 
around the not reinventing the wheel. There are already out there a lot of organizations and initiative, international or regional, which are already working in developing countries in seasonal LDCs um, and can be leveraged and, and collaborate together to bring coherence in those efforts. So CIFAN is a network um, of regional and international initiative. It's a growing network. Um, and uh, the, the aim is really to support uh, those countries uh, that will be uh, requesting support to, to develop projects, structure finance for climate investment. Um, CFAN's most, um, let's say, innovative approach is to embed finance advisors in ministries, direct access entities, or agencies that are key within the project, um, the project cycle in country to unlock uh, the access to climate finance. Why is it innovative? The, the idea is to break, break away from the old um, assistant model that consists in sending um, advisors or, um, or consultants flying fly out of countries. The idea is to hire locally, train and embed those advisors for a period of one to two years in the countries while also building the capacity of over stakeholders involved in the, in the project cycle. Um, next, please. So in, in six steps, uh, this is how the, the CFAN uh, model works. Um, as I was mentioning, um, it all starts with uh, the need expressed uh, by the country. Um, there's a discussion with the country, how and why uh, would a, a CFAN advisor uh, make a difference uh, and help um, en enhancing the flow of, of climate finance into the country. Then the, the advisors are higher locally this is really the, the preference locally meaning in country in the country itself or in the region and the terms of reference the mandate of those advisors is really unique to the country it's tailored to the needs of of the country and some countries as i said uh, earlier um they all, they know what they need in terms of uh what are their priority sectors uh what type of project they want to develop what type of region within the countries um, have to be prioritized and, and so on and so forth. So we can be extremely precise in assigning the mandate to the, to the advisor um, and ensuring that uh, the impact is, is maximum. The third step is, uh, and is a very important one, is, is a, a very intensive and state of art training for those advisors for six weeks. So it's, it's, a very, it's a very serious training um, that all our advisors are going to uh, undertake as a cohort, which is extremely important to us uh, to be able to uh, keep communicating and exchanging within the region, within their own cohort, and, and later on between the different cohort of advisors that will be placed um, in, the different, in the different countries. The advisors are then uh, placed in country, um, either the ministries, uh, finance ministries um, or over agencies or direct access entities. This is also obviously discussed with the country, which is the best, uh, best placement. And the, the advisor are going to be delivering on their mandate, but they are going to be continuously supported by not only the member initiative that hires them uh, locally, but also by the, the whole network. So all the all the member initiatives in the network, RMI as the network coordinator will constantly be backstopping uh, those advisors and they will be also benefiting from continuous training to make sure they are always up to date um, on the requirements of the, of the different uh, financing source. And ultimately the goal is to develop those projects, structure um, the, the financing uh, for investment and get those projects to the finish line for them to be funded. Next. So this is just a brief overview of uh, the CFAN network. As you can see, we have currently uh, 15 uh, global and regional member initiative, very diverse, very complementary in expertise. Uh, RMI serves as the network coordinator. Um, various background, government, think tanks, research institutes, financial institutions. So very rich uh, network that can be uh, very supportive of the advisors. Next. Those the three regions where uh, CFAN is is going to op is operating and going to operate uh, the Pacific, um, Africa with a specific focus um, initially on LDCs and the Caribbean. Next, and and this this is this is the overview of of our theory of change. Um, we believe that um, by embedding those advisors um, in these three regions. 
um, putting them through this very intensive um, training. Um, we are going to provide expertise, know-how, capacity in country to achieve real results. Um, we have an objective of two full proposals per advisor per year and per country, which is um, at, at the same time realistic and ambitious. Um, our first cohort of advisor, eight advisors in the Pacific is going to be introduced at COP26. Um, but our goal is to deploy 30 advisors um, in the three regions that I mentioned by the end of 2022 and um, increase to 50 by the end of 2023, which is about a third of developing countries. So that's very significant. Um, not only we want to, to develop those projects and ensure that financial, um, financial resources flows into countries, but we also want to um, ensure that there's a feedback from the ground, from the experience towards those international uh, financiers to, uh, to make those practices evolve. Next. So these are the eight first countries that are um, in the in the CFAN network, the first cohort. Uh, as you can see, six, eight countries in the Pacific. We are currently hiring the advisor, and we are very excited to start the training in to get to know them and start the training in November. Next. Uh, the training program, just a quick word on that, um, five modules. Uh, as I said, very comprehensive, state of heart. Uh, you can see that uh, it's delivered by a member initiative in the network. It's going to cover the international landscape, um, the different sources, how projects have to be developed for each of the major uh, funders, the, the instrument that is very important. We want to make sure that seeds have access to state-of-art information um, and practice in terms of sophistication of their um, financial proposal. Uh, sectoral expertise, and we always already have indication that the priority sector um, are agriculture, energy, of course, uh, oceans and coast and, and water. So those are going to be big highlights. And finally, we're going to provide our advisor with uh, skills for communication facilitation. Next, and this will be my last slide. Um, I we obviously couldn't help but making a, making a, a connection with, with the upcoming COP. Um, and I've, again, uh, using the word of, of um, Dr. Fletcher, um, we, we not, not only need to scale up climate finance, uh, we also need to speed up climate finance um, because, because climate change is happening even faster than we thought. Uh, so not only the rich nations need to deliver on their 100 billion promise and, and beyond uh, to rebuild the trust between the global north and the global south, but we need also to make those international mechanisms for funding uh, to be uh, more uh, tailored uh, to seeds needs. Um, invest in local capacity development. I used to say that uh, there's not enough international consultant to implement the Paris Agreement, but I do believe that's the case. We cannot achieve 1.5, we cannot reduce vulnerability of, of uh, island nations without transferring the knowledge, grow and cultivate local capacity. And finally, um, unlocking climate finance is also encouraging ambition. Um, it's offering the, the possibility for seeds to have um, to, uh, to implement approaches that are transformational for the whole of society. And my last word would be, I, would, I wanted to, to quote uh, Marshall Island poet, Kathy Jetnil Kijiner, uh, who uh, spoke in, in front of the, the United Nation a few years ago, and who said that island nations, they don't only deserve um, to survive, but they also deserve to thrive. And that's what we can achieve by unlocking climate finance. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Leticia. I, I love your point around the uniqueness of finance and needs of SIDS. Um, small islands have small scale and small projects. You highlighted the lack of corresponding financial mechanisms or support mechanisms. And you finally demonstrated the urgency for SIDS. And, and of course, the great work that CFAN is doing to support SIDS. Thank you so much. Um, so what's next? Um, how can we turn the insights discussed in this conversation into real action? I am pleased to give the floor to our final speaker, Leah Nicholson, the climate finance advisor of uh, the Alliance for Small Island States, permanent mission of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations. Her work includes on the ground project development, climate change policy, law, and other environmental issues. 
She supports the chair of OASIS at this very critical time when the international community is transitioning from negotiation of the uh, Paris Agreement to the urgent implementation. Leah, over to you. Thanks so much, David. And uh, I do have some slides, which hopefully uh, will show up briefly. So I want to answer the two kind of questions. So what would a successful COP look like for SID, the one coming up? And uh, why is climate finance in particular so important for SID? So just two slides to outline this. Um, we saw from Dr. Fletcher how we're overshooting 1.5. And the question is, how do we get back on track? If you notice in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, there is an agenda item dedicated to agriculture, which usually has days of really interesting negotiations around it. There's a growing focus on oceans and nature-based solutions. These are all important, but what's missing? And that is discussion on fossil fuels specifically. About 80% of emissions that have caused global warming are from burning fossil fuels. So where is our agenda item on fossil fuels or at least on the energy systems. So the UK as COP president has set a goal to keep 1.5 degrees in reach at this COP26 coming up. It's outlined the ambitious 2030 GHG reduction targets that countries need to submit to align with net zero by mid-century. But I think we really need to cut to the chase and look at the numbers on this slide. So G20 major emitters handed over $680 billion in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry in one year, which was in 2019. Since the Paris Agreement in 2015, G20 have collectively provided over $3.3 trillion of direct support in fossil fuels, according to the Bloomberg analysis. These subsidies are distorting markets and locking in high emissions for decades to come. And those working in SIDS know that even the most climate vulnerable are susceptible to fossil fuel interests and pressure and we ourselves are also subsidizing fossil fuels. The investment risks are leading to stranded assets. IRENA has estimated $20 trillion in stranded assets between now and 2050, 20 trillion, that's a T. So fossil fuel companies um, are an advocate and key funder of nature-based solutions, which is basically corporate speak for carbon credits. Another COP26 presidency goal is to put political pressure on developed countries to meet the 100 billion climate finance target per year by 2020, supposed to be met last year. And that's what Letitia was mentioning. So far, developed countries have provided just 2 billion B in 2016 to the UN financial mechanism. That's to the UN fund. The number is larger when looking at bilateral and other sources, but through the official UN mechanism, 2 billion per, in 2016. Fossil fuel subsidies in 2019 exceeded this figure by 280 times. So these figures will not course correct. We need to end uh, fossil fuel subsidies and diversify our energy sources so that many cost competitive options for renewables can take hold at a scale that will keep us on 1.5. And we need to learn from mistakes. The 100 billion target was set based on the mitigation costs alone in developing countries. We're going to start discussions on a new climate finance goal, and we should see sub targets as floors for mitigation and adaptation. These are the two things addressing climate change loss and damage, which is how we deal with the consequences and impacts. And we want to see cross cutting targets across these three areas for SID and for non state actors, local NGOs, and community groups who are on the front lines of climate change. If G20 can hand over 600 and $36 billion in one year to fossil fuel subsidies. What is a reasonable climate finance target in our course correction? Another COP26 presidency goal is to raise the profile of adaptation. So launching discussions on a global goal on adaptation will be taking what has been a highly technical discussion into the political realm. And it's gonna be very interesting and we need to see it raise the profile um, of adaptation on par with mitigation given where we're heading. So COP26 will be unlike any other COP. We, we ourselves from SID are making a tremendous sacrifice to get there, risking our health. Some islands are COVID free and risk taking COVID back. Some islands are gonna travel days and days and actually have to charter separate planes to get to COP. But we will get there in as many numbers as we can. And we expect a return on our effort 
and the health risks that we're taking on. Just a few words on specifically around why climate finance is so critical to SIDS. So as we saw, just over 2 billion was provided to the UNFCC fund, UNFCCC funds, divided by 152 developing countries is less than 15 million per country per year. So even if climate finance, however, was in the trillion, as we saw from Letitia's presentation, um, oh yes, that was the second slide. Okay, great, we're there. Um, as we saw from the teacher's presentation, even if trillions of dollars were available, this would not necessarily increase how much climate finance is getting to SIDS. So she made that point very well around the access issues. So while we have the special circumstances recognized for small islands, this is not the, it's not made operational in the fine print of the UNFCCC funds, the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environment Facility, and now the Adaptation Fund. So we have a equality versus an equity um, scenario. What we're currently pursuing in globally is we are putting a lot of capacity building support to SIDS to try to compensate for the lack of internal capacity and our special circumstances. So this is why CFAN is so important and other capacity building for SIDS. But we could achieve the same outcome more efficiently with streamlined rules just for SIDS. So this is moving more towards the equity side where we say, okay, SIDS, we know that you have these capacity constraints, you have smaller projects, you have these kinds of projects, let us streamline that. But we had the simplified approval process window for GCF and that takes longer than the regular window. So far it hasn't worked. And then equality could streamline rules for everyone. We have a lot of bureaucracy in the application process. It takes two years to get one project approved. Um, you know, large high risk projects is one thing, but like a lot of the projects for SIDS are, are smaller size. So we could streamline rules for everyone and that would make like a chain link fence so everyone can see through it and uh, it would really level, level the playing field for everyone. So that's a little bit on the access issue. But just to remind um, all of those listening that one, while 1 1.5 degrees Celsius is definitely better than two degrees, as we saw from the IPCC report, it was an incredibly tough fight even just to get 1.5. It is still not a win for SIDS because at 1.5 degrees of warming, SIDS have exponentially higher per capita climate risk. Already under 1.2 degrees Celsius, some islands are losing 200% of GDP in one hurricane, which is devastating future generations and sustainable development. So for Paris at COP21, we agreed that our people will suffer in a 1.5 degrees Celsius, more extreme world. It's very painful to internalize this climate risk, whether you are, are a small island government, a global business conglomerate, or a wealthy country. Once you designate a uh, area as a high climate risk, the price value drops and it opens it up to wealthy people moving in, financing adaptation, and you have climate gentrification. We've already seen that documented in many places. So there are socioeconomic and political risks as you quantify climate risk on a, on a local to national and beyond scale. So we have to quantify, we have to couple adaptation finance at scale as we adapt and, and zero in on where the climate risks are. It's a climate justice question and we're not able to access that scale yet. In terms of our kind of key targets, AOSIS and IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, are submitting an energy compact for a resilient renewable energy target in SIDS, which will be announced in a few weeks. So there's no question that our ambition as small island states is there. We need equity and access so that none of our uh, communities are left behind, even in a 1.5 degree Celsius world. So David, back over to you. Thank you, Leah. Um, Leah your insights uh, struck me personally. I think um, I was struck by the level of subsidies provided to the fossil fuel industry. Um, the grave impact, you know, this is having on, on SIDS and um, the fact that 200% of, you know, a country's GDP is lost in one hurricane, um, you know, demonstrating how we can level the playing field and, and build equality and equity um, and, and, and provide access to finance is such a key tool 
for us to, to make the change we need to for SIDS. Um, now I'd like to invite our attendees today to um, submit their questions if you have not already done so in the Zoom chat. Um, our team is collecting all the questions and, and, and uh, compiling them and we'll, we'll, we'll jump right to the Q&A because I do see that a few persons have already posted some questions. Um, so with that said, um, I guess to start, start off things here, I'd like to um, uh, put to uh, both Leah and Leticia, um, what do you see as the biggest barriers to capacity building around climate finance? And also, what successful examples of capacity development have you observed that can apply to the Caribbean? You want to take that first, Leticia? Sure. Well, um, so the, the biggest barrier, I think, um, one that is sort of obvious is is the small size of of um, governments in 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 small island states. It's if you have the experience of working with colleagues in small island states, you you know that they are wearing five hats at the same time, um, and um, there's simply um, you know human resources. Um, issue. Um, there's also, I, I believe, um, the lack of resources to cultivate those, those talents in, in the region. Um, many times um, you work with colleagues in, in, in the region and they are very successful and then um, suddenly they, they leave the region um, to join a, a bigger institution. So offering opportunities for young professionals in the region, um, I believe, um, is also extremely important. And I think there's also the transfer of knowledge um, that has not been organized in such a way that um, allows for the, the retention of this knowledge um, in the region um, and also probably the lack of sometimes access to data, uh, sufficient data um, to um, support um, the projects that are being developed and, and submitted to, uh, to international um, financing institution. Um, and before uh, ending over to, to Leah, I think um, an example of success is, is what has happened in Antigua and Barbuda. I think Antigua and Barbuda has demonstrated uh, that by, um, by not only mobilizing its own resources um, to access funding, but also very strategically accessing technical assistance, readiness support to grow uh, the capacity, to grow um, the team um, and, and train the team to access resources has, has shown tremendous success. Um, so don't want to steal your thunder, Leah, but I think um, if you ask me for, for a successful example, definitely Antigua and Barbuda is one of those. Um, but I think across the region in the Caribbean, um, a lot of effort has been made um, to, to, develop, uh, to develop that capacity and uh, a, boost, a, a boost is needed to, to go over the last hurdle that is um, developing full proposals. Uh, but, um, but I think they, they are, the potential is, is tremendous. Yeah, just to, I, I mean, just to build on what the teacher is saying, I think, you know, we need to simplify the rules and standardize across different sources. Every, you have to build capacity for 15 different sets of rules to access that. And you have a best practice out there. So let's start to see standardization across that will streamline it. So we can't lose focus on the need to simplify um, access. But I think there's also kind of a structural challenge around SIDS, which is that it's very hard to do projects in SIDS. It takes a lot of work. There's few people to get it done. They're remote. I mean, it, it's just hard. Um, and so I think a lot of the international entities, you know, there's a fixed kind of fee. Projects are smaller. So they just get less uh, room to work with. It, 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 you know, there's, there's a cost. So it's been hard for SIDS to find international partners, which is part of the driver for direct access, like Leticia was saying. And SIDS are slowly making progress. I mean, there are 11 regional and 17 national direct access entities accredited from SIDS to the Green Climate Fund, um, or that serve as delivery partners um, and the Adaptation Fund, which are the two funds that do direct access. 
And for those that don't know, direct access is where you have a national or in the GCF's case, a regional institution that's accredited directly to the fund. Um, so you don't have to have that going through an international intermediary. So the benefits are shorter timelines. And I think also um, that national priorities aren't filtered through often more powerful intermediaries in the case of SIDS anyway. So um, there's been progress on direct access, but the, as Letitia said, the funding proposals is much lower. It's only eight approved funding proposals from direct access entities. Um, and that's really where we need to put our effort. I think I agree with Letitia, Antigua and Barbuda has had a lot of success. It actually has the highest amount of climate finance through direct access um, to date. And the goal is on seeing much stronger pipelines. Um, so it's not just about changing international access, it's about opening up the options that SIDs have. So you always, every SID has an international access option. So let's add national and regional direct access options for every SID. Great, thank you for sharing your insight there. Um, here I'm in Dr. Fletcher, I'll, I'll have you take this one. Um, in, in one sentence, what would success be like for island nations at COP26? Okay, I'll, I'll probably start off. Um, there are three big things I think, and I'm going to put them in one sentence, that island nations would want to see at SIDS, at COP, sorry, at COP26. Um, one, very importantly, is very strong ambition among the developed countries to bend that temperature curve down to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, if, if we don't get to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and as Leah pointed out, it's not like 1.5 is a panacea that, that once, you, once you keep it below 1.5, you're safe. We've seen very devastating impacts already um, at 1.5, well, below 1.5 at 1 degree Celsius. So, so the first would be um, ensuring that we have a, an increase in ambition so that we can get that, that global temperature increase to get down to that 1.5 degree Celsius pathway. Second is access to financing. So scaled up financing and access to the financing. So it's not, it's not just opening up more branches, which is sometimes what we do when we have more accredited entities. But if you don't have that ATM card that will allow you to withdraw money from the bank, then it doesn't matter how many branches are open up. So, so dealing with the issues, um, we have to deal with the internal issues, but ensure that there is greater access to scaled up financing. And the third is to operationalize that, that Paris rule book so that we can get the Paris Agreement up and running because the Paris Agreement right now is just an agreement, but the things in there that will allow us to realize the great um, aspirations that are in Paris, these have to be put in the Paris rulebook. So we need to finalize. So in my one sentence, um, I would like to see greater ambition um, in greenhouse gas reduction, greenhouse gas emission reductions, um, greater access and scaled up finance and the finalization of the rulebook that will make Paris work. Here, I'd be happy to hear your perspective. Thank you, David. Um, definitely, it will not be one sentence. <laughs> but um, in an online lecture organized by the London School of Economics, the UN Climate Exchange Executive Secretary, Patricia Espinosa, expressed the following. One of the four elements that would constitute a successful outcome of UN Climate Conference COP26 is that all promises made to the developing countries are kept especially the pledge by developed nations to mobilize 100 billion in climate finance annually by 2020. To that I say that, that those promises, especially pledged by developed nations to be mobilized 100 billion in climate finance must, be, must include island nations for the development and implementation of solar energy microgrids. Success for island nations would be achieved with concrete climate action that will go beyond the traditional empty promises. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to queue up our, our next question um, for um, Leah. What type of financial targets are being discussed beyond the $100 billion? And given the information you presented about the G20 fossil fuel subsidies, um, what are your thoughts? On, on that target? Yeah, so the 100 billion target was set in around 2009 for to be met by the year 2020. Um, that is for developed countries to meet, to assist developing countries to implement climate change. 
So uh, that target was then extended by parties through to 2025, by which time all parties should agree to a new climate finance target. So it's going to be kind of a multi-year process. Um, already some, I think uh, South Africa has thrown out a $750 billion target, but I think everyone agrees that it needs to be a much more consultative process um, because the last one was basically just put out there based on some analysis for mitigation costs. So it needs to be much more cons consultative. And then I kind of outlined some of the things we as AOSIS see, targets for mitigation, floors, floors for mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. And then also let's disaggregate and see what SIDS are getting. It's hard to answer. This is how much climate finance SIDS are receiving. It's very obscure. So let's see a target for SIDS that all the funds have to report on. And let's see much more channeling down to exactly where, like well, let's have a KPI, a performance indicator, based on how much money is getting down to the local level of every dollar that's available. And that's where the NGO target comes in. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanna make note that feel free to post questions in the chat. Um, if we can't get to all your questions because we're, we're a bit short on time at this point in time, we'll certainly respond uh, via email and, and reach out to you with some responses to your questions. Um, with that said, um, I would like to um, basically, I guess, recognize um, that many global cell, many in the global, members of the global cell may not be able to be at the table at COP26 due to the lack of access to COVID vaccines across the global cell. This makes listening to the needs of leaders from these regions critical to ensure we are advocating for in, 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 intentional and targeted action on their behalf. The impacts of the conversation extend beyond the words exchange and commitments made at COP26. Rather, the real impact is how those actions can preserve island nations as hab habitable homes for generations to come and as test grounds for a global clean and resilient energy transition. We want you to follow along with our partners and, you know, to do so, I'd like to hand it over to each of our partners here today to say how you can support, um, how you can support their various causes and the great initiatives that they have ongoing. With that said, uh, panelists, would you please share a little bit about how attendees at today's webinar can support your various organizations? Okay, I'll, I'll kick off. Thanks, David. Um, one of the things that I did last year was to start this project called the Caribbean Climate Justice Project, which seeks to educate and empower civil society on issues related to climate change and, and to get a conversation about climate justice going. What does climate justice mean for us? Why, why do we need to ensure that there is special attention paid to the citizens of small island developing states and the impact that climate change is having on them? And also, how do we get our governments to, to ramp up their own advocacy and their own work in international negotiating theaters across the board? Because I think sometimes we, we view climate change as an issue just for the Ministry of the Environment or the Ministry of Responsibility for Climate Change, but it's not. Every single government agency has responsibility for climate change because climate change is impacting every single sector, every single individual, and particularly in countries like ours where we have vulnerable populations, we are even more at risk, quite apart from our geography but just the fact that our vulnerability makes us, our economic vulnerability, our social vulnerability, makes us more um, exposed to the risks of climate change. So, so I started this Caribbean Climate Justice Project, which you can access information on, on CaribbeanClimateJustice.org. And um, to, to get civil society to understand the issues and to work primarily to begin with, with young people. So, we um, started a, a few contests with young people, getting them to, to write to us on their views, their perspectives of climate change in poetry and in prose and in, in, in photographs. We had a competition that went, I mean, exceeded our expectations. We, we got almost 400 poems. I didn't know we had so many poets in the Caribbean, um, almost 200 essays, 175 photographs. And we plan on putting the best of those in an anthology that we will produce 
Um, we wanted to do it in time for COP26, but that's not looking possible now with the volume of, of, of um, entries that we got. And we're also doing on the 23rd of September, and I'd invite everyone to tune in, a virtual, the inaugural virtual Caribbean Youth Parliament on Climate Justice, where we've chosen 15 youth parliamentarians who will speak on various elements of climate change, climate change on health, climate change on human, and human rights. And they will debate a resolution that we hope to then present to all of our regional institutions, CARICOM, the OECS Commission, Five Cs, um, Caribbean Development Bank, but also hopefully get it up um, to the UN. Um, we, we have uh, the, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Climate Change is a Caribbean national, Ambassador Selwyn Hart, who was very instrumental um, in the work that Ban Ki-moon's team did in during COP21. So we really want to get our civil society engaged in climate change so that they provide that, that, that thrust, that, that support to our negotiators, and, and they all also stimulate our governments to take more action and to take this more seriously across the board at the finance level, at the tourism level, at the agriculture level, at the water security level. So, um, so yes, CaribbeanClimateJustice.org, um, whatever support you could give, um, it could be moral support, technical support, there's um, financial support, then we will welcome it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Hiram, would you go right ahead? Thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> uniting my, my voice with uh, Dr. Fletcher uh, in Fundación Comunitaria Puerto Rico, we have been working very hard to work with capacity building and helping our uh, the unprivileged uh, communities. So if you could follow us on www.fcpr.org, you could see there all the work that we have been doing in Puerto Rico and and any any help is is a good help. So log in and just see what we have been doing, and and hopefully um, it will move you to uh, to help and contribute. Thank you, uh, Leah. If you could quickly let us know how we can support your initiatives. Yeah, I think um, I think your comments were really uh, kind of David around like people don't know like you weren't aware of the fossil fuel subsidies I think that's a common thing I think that people do not know how much money is being poured into an industry that is essentially on its way out and you know I only spoke about the mitigation the emission side but I think Haram made great points around the resilience of fossil fuels as well it's not a resilient option and yet we have so many options out there that are much more cost effective if you're on a level playing field without subsidies. So we need to get the word out and attention around the fossil fuel subsidies. I think Bloomberg uh, Climate Policy Factbook has done, if you just look that up, it's done all the legwork for you. You have country amount of fossil fuels for all G20 members. So start to use this time between now and COP26 to put a focus on you know, what will course correct for 1.5 degrees. Let's not get distracted in a lot of the nice to haves when the house is basically on fire. I, uh, our prime minister, Antigua Barbuda, um, uh, Prime Minister Gaston Brown, is going to be writing to all G20 members with this information and having follow up calls and discussions. So let's start putting pressure to um, up the ambition. Changing NDC targets is, of course, important. This is very tangible and something we can, we can ask for. Everyone, all countries also need to up their 2030 ambition. All right. um, I would also, yeah, sorry, one last plug is for our podcast on Islands on Alert, which is just released the first version on Monday, and AOSIS is putting this out every Monday leading up to COP26, so please listen in and uh, contribute to the discussion. Thanks. And I know we're just past time, but Letitia, if you can share your final thoughts. Sure, uh, thank you. Well, I I mean, it's really hard to follow <laughs> all those um, um, awesome points from, from previous presenters, but I think um, as, as Yeah was saying, we need to create this eco chamber that seeds cannot be left cannot be left behind. Um, that uh, the time to act is is now. Uh, so we need to really create uh, this sense of urgency, um, and that COP twenty six cannot be a success without um, a fair um, outcome uh, for seeds. Um, and in terms of what 
what our uh, participant can do, I, I see in the chat um, that the information has been posted, please continue the conversation, uh, join the, the various events that are coming up. And in particular, we are organizing this event during the, the New York Climate Week, cutting the crap on climate finance, a commitment to the global south. Uh, so as you can see, it's uh, we are going to uh, really address the hard questions. And we have uh, there also um, a really good panelists from uh, different um, uh, different backgrounds, including from uh, small island developing states. Um, so sense of urgency, continuing the conversation, um, and um, pragmatism. I think now what we need is action. And I think there's been a lot of rigidity on all sides, um, on rules, um, on principles. And although those principles are very important, as I was saying, the house is on fire. So now we absolutely need to open, um, open the flow of finance um, and 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 act on the ground. Um, so we are we are trying to do our best uh, to do that, and um, hope that um, all our participants can join us in that effort. Thank you so much, Atisha. Uh, our guests and panelists, thank you so much for all you presented and shared with us today. It was really exciting to hear about all your various initiatives. Uh, attendees, thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate your patience for the technical difficulties and. Uh, we appreciate you spending an extra three to four minutes with us today. Um, we welcome you to click on all the links in the chat, or you can export the chat so you can have the links or copy and paste the links from the chat. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.